Noble Lies, Part 2, Hollywood Deception. FCM, Ephesians, Chapter 6, Verses 11 to 13. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim, so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day, and having done all, to stand. Edward Bernays, Propaganda, page 166. The American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. It is a great distributor for ideas and opinions. The motion picture can standardize the ideas and habits of a nation. My first job at CIA was case officer for a French uh, left operation, non-communist left. And it was then that I was case officer for uh, labor operations in France. And Irving Brown was then... Um, receiving money from us, which he was passing around in France. At St. Paul, AFL President William Green Center and Dick Walsh left, theatrical labor leader, hear Irving Brown give a first-hand report on the value of American motion pictures abroad. I have just returned from Europe, where as the representative of the American Federation of Labor for over four years, I have had the chance to see the terrific impact that the American movies are having on the peoples abroad, particularly those behind the Iron Curtain. This places a great responsibility upon the American people and the American motion picture industry. The CIA's presence in Hollywood is harder to detect. It goes back to the early days of the Cold War and was designed to counter a propaganda effort coming out of the Soviet Union. The CIA placed undercover agents in major studios where they monitored left-wing screenwriters and directors. This was at the height of Cold War paranoia and Hollywood was under the scrutiny of the US Congress. Is investigating alleged communist influence and infiltration in the moving picture industry? The agency started influencing scripts one senior executive at Paramount Pictures, working covertly for the CIA, described how, to counter what the Soviets were saying about the persecution of African Americans, quote, well-dressed Negroes, unquote, would be planted in certain films. Looking forward to having this dialogue. I think this is a powerful discussion because post-Cosby, you know, before Cosby you had good times, and I've, I've talked about it before, and during the Good Times era, James Evans, when he was on the show, he was basically kicked off, to my understanding. He represented a different kind of father. Stern, didn't take no mess. Poor. Poor. And I think a lot of black folks didn't like seeing that reality, even though it might be more reflective of their own father. So what happened was, was you know, Bill Cosby saw a void and created this other kind of father. And I'm not saying that people didn't have that father. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that I need to give you context on wealth to understand the Cosby show. I need you to understand that what nobody talking about no million dollars in 1983 and 84. It took $75 million to make the fortune 400. I said that before in 1984. Understand what I mean is a million was like impossible. It was like, I can't even explain how un real that number is. And the reason why it's important is what you see is that initially, as I understand it, Cosby was the Bill Cosby family. The Huxtables were in a different home and they moved into this brownstone. This is the problem though. The brownstone was worth $900,000. You know, I covered this in my piece. You can get the more details in the piece I did called Cosby show dreams and African-American financial reality. What I showed, and I, I'll read it to you so you can kind of get an understanding. While viewers believed the Cosby clan believe, lived in Brooklyn Heights, the real home 
was located at 10 Leroy Street in the West Village. In 1984, a Brooklyn Heights brownstone would have gone for around $700,000. A Brooklyn Heights townhouse would cost five to seven million dollars today. Giving this context, in the early 1980s, normal home loans were given at a rate of about 15%. A loan of this type would have been likely considerably higher. In addition, a prospective buyer would have to come with anywhere from 10 to 20% or more of the home value as the down payment. On the low end, this Huxtable family would have had to put down $100,000 in cash and paid a mortgage of $8,000 a month in the early 80s. This would be the equivalent of an $18,000 mortgage today. Oh, like four, that's like putting down $400,000 or some crazy number. Black family, a doctor and a lawyer. This is the problem is like, we just think about money like it's static. And we think about money like it's colorless. But the nation and the data shows us that it isn't. It's moving and it's really white. Let me say that again. It's moving fast, meaning money, and it's really, really white. I've I've shared the data before with you. You know, there's 83 million white homes. Approximately 13 million are worth a million or more. 870,000 are worth over, over 12 million. Out of all of black families, 20 million black homes, we got about 370,000 black families worth a million or more. All old, almost all older people, 1.1, 1.2 with their pension in their house. So how real is it then to show a black family living in a multi-million dollar house in the 80s for everybody to get a context of blackness? See, it, 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 and I think that this is an important discussion because bl- black respectability relies on a certain fantasy, I believe. A fantasy that America was different and is different than it is. Oh, We're going to get deep today. I, I, I look at this thing and I look at black economics and I have to question, how did we get here? I have to l- l- ask the question of how did we get to the point where we refuse to see ourselves in the mirror? Where we really just want to want to be an, have an escape hatch. You know, I, I, I continue on with this thing. And, you know, I did a piece called Cosby Show Dreams and, and African-American Financial Realities. And what I said is, despite the, and you can't, let me say this, you can't deny the positive impact that the Cosby Show did have on so many young African-Americans, let alone the introduction of black people to white people that had no interaction with white, with black people. They started seeing, because this was a, for it to be the most watched show, white people were watching this every week. But the question becomes, at what cost did that did that leave black America? Because were white people watching a black family or were white people watching a black family that made them feel good? And where we're at now is this, is this era where we start to look at this thing. And what we see is, as I said, in the, and, and I'm going to share a section for, with you from the Cosby Show Dreams article. Yet, despite this positive impact on the exceptional black individual's acceptance into white America's psyche because of the show, it may have done the opposite for America's ability to relate to the average black family struggles that resulted from a legacy of Jim Crow and slavery. For a generation of white Americans that had little contact with black America in daily life, the apathy Thursday nights with the Huxtables created towards the experience of black struggle has been understated. The idea, if Cliff Huxtable did it, you can too, rang loudly in the expectations of black progress. So, you know, you look at this thing, and and for so long, Bill Cosby avoided gangs. He avoided crack cocaine. I mean, this is in the middle of crack cocaine ravaging neighborhoods across the country. I've shown that to you in my documentary, Freeway Cracking the System. This is in the moment of of mass incarceration rising to its height, which is the very irony of, of Bill Cosby everybody's dad being caught in the shadow of that now. The imagery of him behind bars is something else. So what you see is we all have to deal with this thing called race. I don't care how high you fly. I don't care how much money you get. It is your responsibility to be aware of race. Now, the, the thing that, 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 that frames this thing for me about the Cosby Show is Denise, Denise Huxtable. You know, I read this article 
you know, I'm not I'm not saying it's true, but it, it was from a reputable news site. But what it showed, you know, everybody, I never knew what happened to Denise. She just disappeared off a different world. Well, there was a great article that kind of explained she got pregnant with uh, Lenny Kravitz's baby. And when he when she got pregnant with Lenny Kravitz's baby, what happened was uh, Debbie Allen, you know, she's doing a different world, came to Bill Cosby, said, I, I, you know, she she's pregnant. And, and, and I want her to be on the show. This will reflect the realities of black life. We can write a great, great set of, of shows about a black woman in college despite being pregnant. And you know what Bill Cosby said back to, to Debbie Allen purportedly? He said, Denise, Den, he said, he said uh, Lisa Bonet is pregnant, but Denise Huxtable is not. And that was the end of Denise Huxtable on the Cosby Show for some years. She came back some years later, if you recall. But for a lot of years, she just was gone. And, you know, I look at this thing and I have to ask, is that the cost of black respectability? That we got to put all the skeletons under the bed and in the closet. That we got to make this thing look like slavery never happened, Jim Crow never happened. Do we got to give up everything just to have something? In a world where everybody else is just living. B.F. Skinner, Science and Human Behavior, page 6. If we are to use the methods of science in the field of human affairs, we must assume that behavior is lawful and determined. We must expect to discover that what a man does is the result of specifiable conditions, and that once these conditions have been discovered, we can anticipate and to some extent determine his actions. B.F. Skinner, Science and Human Behavior, page 14. The scientific system, like the law, is designed to enable us to handle a subject matter more efficiently. What we call the scientific conception of a thing is not passive knowledge. Science is not concerned with contemplation. When we have discovered the laws which govern a part of the world about us, and when we have organized these laws into a system, we are then ready to deal effectively with that part of the world. By predicting the occurrence of an event, we are able to prepare for it. By arranging conditions in ways specified by the laws of a system, we not only predict we control, we cause an event to occur or to assume certain characteristics. Puzzles and magic. I work in what most people think are two distinct fields, but I believe they are the same. I am both a magician and a New York Times crossword puzzle constructor, which basically means I've taken the world's two nerdiest hobbies and combined them into one career. <laughs> and I believe that magic and puzzles are the same because they both key into one of the most important human drives, the urge to solve. Human beings are wired to solve, to make order out of chaos. It's certainly true for me. I've been solving my whole life. High school consisted of epic Scrabble matches in the cafeteria, and not really talking to girls. And then, at about that time, I started learning magic tricks, and definitely not talking to girls. There's nothing like starting a conversation with, hey, did you know that prestidigitation is worth 20 points in Scrabble? <laughs> But back then, I noticed an intersection between puzzles and illusion. When you do the crossword puzzle, or when you watch a magic show, you become a solver. And your goal is to try to find the order in the chaos, the chaos of, say, a black and white puzzle grid, a mixed up bag of Scrabble tiles, or a shuffled pack of playing cards. And today, as a cruciverbalist, 23 points, and an illusion designer, I create that chaos. I test your ability to solve. Now, it turns out, research tells us that solving is as primal as eating and sleeping. From birth, we are wired to solve. In one UCLA study, 
newborns still in the hospital were shown patterns, patterns like this: circle, cross, circle, cross. And then the pattern was changed: triangle, square. And by tracking an infant's gaze, we know that newborns, as young as a day old, can notice and respond to disruptions in order. It's it's remarkable. So from infancy through old age, the urge to solve unites us all. And I even found this photo on Instagram of pop star Katy Perry solving a crossword puzzle with her morning coffee. Like, <laughs> now solving exists across all cultures. The American invention is the crossword puzzle. And this year, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the crossword puzzle, first published in the New York World. But many other cultures have their signature puzzles as well. China gives us tangrams, which would test solvers' abilities to form shapes from the jumbled pieces. Chaos, order, order, and order. That one's my favorite. Let's hear it again. Okay. <laughs> And how about this puzzle, invented in 18th century England, the jigsaw puzzle? Is this not making order out of chaos? So as you can see, we are always solving. We are always trying to decode our world. It's an eternal quest. It's just like the one Cervantes wrote about in Don Quixote, which, by the way, is the root of the word quixotry, the highest-scoring Scrabble word of all time, 365 points. But anyway. Um, Don Quixote is an important book. You guys have read Don Quixote, yes? I'm seeing some heads nod. Come on, guys, really? Who's read Don Quixote? Let's do this. Raise your hands if you've read Don Quixote. There we go, smart audience. Who's read Don Quixote? Get them up. Okay, good. Because I need somebody smart here. Because now I'm going to demonstrate with the help of one of you just how deeply rooted your urge to solve is. Just how wired to solve all of you really are. So I'm going to come into the audience and、uh, find somebody to help me. Let's see. Everybody's looking away all of a sudden.、Uh, um, can I? Would you? What is your name, Gwen? I'm not a mind reader. I can see your name tag. Come with me, Gwen. Everyone, give her a round of applause. Make her feel welcome. Gwen, after you. Are you so excited? <laughs> Did you know that your name is worth eight points in Scrabble? <laughs> okay. Stand right here, Gwen. Right here. <laughs> Now, Gwen. Before we begin, I'd like to point out a piece of the puzzle, which is here in this envelope, and I will not go near it. Okay? And over here we have a drawing of some farm animals. You can see we have an owl, we have a horse, a donkey, a rooster, an ox, and a sheep. And then here, Gwen, we have some fancy art store markers,、uh, colors like. Can you see that word right there? No. Cobalt. Cobalt. Yes, cobalt. Well, we have a we have a silver, we have a red, an emerald, and an amber marker. And Gwen, you are going to color this. Drawing, just like you were five years old, one marker at a time. It's going to be a lot of fun, all right. But I'm going to go over here. I don't want to see what you're doing, okay? So don't don't start yet. Wait, wait for me to get over here and close my eyes. Now, Gwen, are you ready? Pick up just one marker. Pick up just one marker, and why don't you color in the horse for me? Color in the horse, a big, big, big、uh, scribbles, broad strokes. Don't worry about staying in the lines. All right, great. And why don't you take that marker and recap it and place it on the table for me? Okay, and pick up another marker out of the cup, and take take off the cap, and color in the donkey for me. Color in the donkey, big scribbles. Okay, cool. And recap that marker and place it on the table, and pick up another marker for me, and take off the cap. Isn't this fun? And color color in the owl for me. Color in the owl. Okay, and recap recap that marker and pick up another marker out of the cup. And color on the rooster for me. Color on the rooster. Good, 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 good. Big, big, big strokes. Good, good. Pick up another marker out of the cup. And color on the ox for me. Color on the ox. Okay, good. And 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 a lot of color on that. And recap and place it on the table. And pick up another marker out of the cup. Oh, I'm out. I'm out. Okay, I'm gonna turn. I'm gonna turn around. Did I forget him? Oh, I forgot my purple marker. This is still gonna work though. I, th I think、uh, this is still gonna work mostly. <laughs> All right, so Gwen, I'm going to hand you this envelope. Don't open it yet. Not open it yet. But I'm going to write down your choices so that everybody can see the choices that you made. Okay, great. So we have a okay, we have a cobalt 
horse, amber, owl, a silver ox, yes, okay, a red donkey, and what was the emerald color? A rooster, an emerald rooster. Okay, now for the moment of truth, Gwen. We're going to take a look in that envelope. Why don't you open it up and remove the one piece of paper from inside and hand it to me, and we will see if it matches your choices. Yes, I think it does. We have a cobalt horse, we have a red donkey, we have an amber owl, we have an emerald rooster, a silver ox. I forgot my purple marker, so we have a blank sheep, but that's a pretty amazing coincidence, don't you think? Gwen, well done. That's beautiful. I'll take that back from you. So, ladies and gentlemen, how is this possible? How is this possible? Well, could it be that Gwen's brain is so wired to solve that she decoded hidden messages? Well, this is the puzzle I present to you. Could there be order in the chaos that I created? Let's take a closer look. Do you recall when I showed you these puzzle pieces? What image did it ultimately become? A cobalt horse. The plot thickens. And then we played a game of tangrams with an emerald rooster. <laughs> that one's my favorite. And then we had an experiment with a silver ox. And Katy Perry drinks her morning coffee out of a amber owl. Thank you, Katy, for taking that photo for me. Oh, and there's one more. There's one more. I believe you colored a red donkey, Gwen. Ladies and gentlemen, could you raise your hands for me if you've read Don Quixote? Who's read <laughs> Don Quixote? But wait, but wait, 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 wait. There's more. There's more. Gwen, I was so confident that you were going to make these choices that I made another prediction, and I put it in an even more indelible place, and it's right here. Ladies and gentlemen, we have today's New York Times. The date is March 18th, 2014. Many of you in the first couple of rows have it underneath your seats as well. Really dig, we hid them under there. See if you can fish out the newspaper and open up to the arts section and you will find the crossword puzzle. And the crossword puzzle today was written by yours truly. You can see my name above the grid. I'm going to give this to you, Gwen, to take a look. And I will also put it up on the screen. Now let's take a look at another piece of the puzzle. If you look at the first clue for one across, it starts with the letter C for corrupt. And just below that, we have an O for outfielder. And if you keep reading the first letters of the clues down, you get cobalt horse, amber owl, silver ox, red donkey, and emerald rooster. That's pretty cool, right? the New York Times. But wait, 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 wait. Oh, Gwen, do you recall how I forgot my purple marker and you were unable to color the sheep? Well, if you keep reading, starting with 25 down, it says, oh, by the way, the sheep can be left blank. But wait, 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 there's one more thing, there's one more thing. There's one final piece of the puzzle. Gwen, I am so grateful for your choices because if we take a look at the first letters of your combinations, we get C-H-A-O-S for chaos and O-R-D-E-R -E for order. That's chaos and order. We've all made order out of chaos. So ladies and gentlemen, the next time you find yourself with a puzzle, whether it's in your life or in your work, or maybe it's at the Sunday morning breakfast table with the New York Times. Remember, you are all wired to solve. Thank you. Stanley Milgram, Obedience to Authority and Experimental View, page XIX. Obedience, because of its very ubiquitousness, is easily overlooked as a subject of inquiry in social psychology. 
but without an appreciation of its role in shaping human action, a wide range of significant behavior cannot be understood. For an act carried out under command is psychologically of a profoundly different character than action that is spontaneous. The person who, with inner conviction, loathes stealing, killing, and assault may find himself performing these actions with relative ease when commanded by authority. Behavior that is unthinkable in an individual who is acting on his own may be executed without hesitation when carried out under orders. Stanley Milgram, Obedience to Authority and Experimental View, page XX. The essence of obedience consists in the fact that a person comes to view himself as an instrument for carrying out another person's wishes, and he therefore no longer regards himself as responsible for his actions. Once this critical shift of viewpoint has occurred in the person, all of the essential features of obedience follow. The adjustment of thought, the freedom to engage in cruel behavior, and the types of justification experienced by the person are essentially similar whether they occur in a psychological laboratory or the control room of a ICBM site. 